I'm using a um, voice prosthesis, which is a very simple little nylon valve with a flap on the back that stops me, um, me ale and me grub going down into me uh, lungs. When I stop the air coming out, people often think we're pressing something, but we're not. Just stop the air coming out and it has to go through the valve. When someone has a laryngectomy, they have the, the larynx removed so they no longer have a voice box. They no longer have vocal cords to vibrate and produce sound. But they are able to use muscles in the pharynx and the esophagus to produce a different voice. What surgeons now do at the time of surgery is to make a fistula, which is a hole, which will link the trachea with the esophagus. And that allows a route for air to pass from the trachea into the esophagus. That air can be used to vibrate these muscles in the pharynx and the esophagus to produce a new, different sounding voice. In order for that um, air to, to pass through the fistula, the person has to cover the stoma, the hole in the neck, as they breathe out. And that will mean that the air will have no other route to go through but through this little fistula. I am here getting my voice left through using the Servomps machine. An artificial larynx is an electronic device. It's um, a device which a patient holds against their neck and it emits uh, a sound, a tone, which passes through the tissue in the neck into the, into the mouth. And the patient would then articulate that move the tongue and their lips as they would have done before when speaking to produce um, to produce speech. When I attained the Sophodil voice, which I'm using now, it was probably the one of the most uh, satisfying moments in my life. Esophageal voice is the technique that uh, patients used to um, have to try and learn before the surgical voice restoration was developed. And basically that is a technique of pumping air back um, into the pharynx and the esophagus to, to work those muscles uh, and to produce voice. To pump the air back, patients have to learn to use the tongue and the muscles in the cheeks to actually push the air back. They don't actually swallow the air down. Sometimes people talk about patients swallowing air. They don't want it to go all the way down to the stomach. They only want it to go so far back. And then they have to learn this technique of, of um, producing sound on that air as it gets to the back of the pharynx and the esophagus. When, after somebody has their surgery and before they have a valve fitted, um, they will communicate often by mouthing or what we call silent articulation, which is basically just um, mouthing messages but without any sound. Um, obviously that can be quite demanding on the listener because uh, you, you really have to uh, concentrate and be able to to pick up the message just by watching somebody's lip, uh, lips and, and, and mouth move. Um, some people are better mouthers and clearer mouthers than others. It's usually only a technique that's, that's used in the short term. Not many people would be able to use that method in the longer term because it is so difficult uh, and there will be breakdowns in communication often. In time, some people can learn to manage more than one of these techniques and can benefit from the flexibility of switching between them. No head and neck unit would expect you to tackle any problems with speech production, so if any arise, it's just a matter of referring the patient back to the unit. By the time of discharge, you should hopefully have already established a good dialogue with your local head and neck unit. No, no problem at all. Voice is only one means of communication, and you can help your patients by introducing them to other means of communication, such as text messaging from mobile phones, fax and email, and text phone. And don't forget, good old-fashioned pen and paper can be an effective means of communication. It is fairly obvious that when one removes the voice box, there's going to be changes in voice. But people often forget all the other things that are lost at the same time. Many of these things are functions that we regard as normal human functions, part of the way that we interact with one another, part when we eat and drink and swallow and laugh and cry, the normal human emotions. 
All of these can be affected. We therefore have to look at the whole person undergoing a laryngectomy and not just think about speech rehabilitation. For example, without a larynx, swallowing can be compromised. Now, in fact, most laryngectomies can eat a very normal diet by some months after the operation, although not everybody can. And it's important that one balances expectations against reality. In the early days, we would just start off with small quantities, small portions of soft foods, things like scrambled eggs or mashed potatoes, that kind of thing. And we would encourage the individual to eat small portions, but perhaps more often in the day than, than you might normally think. Most individuals find that they have a, a reduced taste sensation. One thing we want to avoid at all costs is an individual losing a significant amount of weight um, because, as we know, good nutrition is very important in the wound healing process. Um, so we would always look to try to encourage the individual to make a few simple changes like using more herbs and spices, making good use of seasonings, looking at colourings and different textures of food to try to encourage their appetite. Drinking fluids will help to stimulate the taste buds and it can help to promote the taste sensations to return, which in turn will help to improve the patient's appetite. If the patient's having difficulty maintaining their weight, then I would suggest that you refer back to the head and neck unit for a consult with a dietitian. There's one topic where your advice can be invaluable, but it may not be very welcome, health promotion. Head and neck cancers are largely related to smoking and drinking. Such social behaviour may well have played a part in the person's need for a laryngectomy in the first place. And obviously, they need to understand that continuing the same lifestyle carries a high risk of another cancer. Alcohol consumption should be minimised, but for smoking, there can be only one aim, complete cessation. Head and neck units are strong on this, and in most cases, smokers will have been started on a smoking cessation programme while still in hospital. For patients undergoing radiotherapy, there's an even more pressing need to stop smoking and drinking. Both can seriously exacerbate the side effects of the radiotherapy. You may well find that the period of radiotherapy side effects provides a window of several weeks in which you can be of real help to someone wishing to quit these damaging habits. Sitting about indoors, I got a, quite a lot of stress from that. So I took up all the colour painting, which I found relaxed me and unwound quite a lot. Adjusting to the life-changing experience of having cancer and having a laryngectomy can be very traumatic for both the patient and for the family. The patient can experience mood swings, whether deep depression, whether become withdrawn from the family or become aggressive. They've had a surgical procedure which has changed how they breathe, how they cough and how they speak. What's important to a film though is that the person remains the same. Essentially, the cancer has been removed, but you still have the same person. The loss of confidence and self-esteem that they may initially experience will gradually return, particularly with the help and support of family and friends. They are the same person they were before. In many cases, the laryngectomy will return to their normal job. Someone who's had a laryngectomy has to take special care over a range of safety issues, most obviously, there's the special equipment associated with their stoma. Here, the message is to follow the manufacturer's guidelines. But there are also issues concerning things that most of us hardly think about. Because of the loss of smell that the patient who has had a laryngectomy may encounter, it is important that the family and the patient are more aware about the safety aspects around the home. There is danger due to not being able to detect uh, smoke or gas. Therefore it is important that the individuals do have the smoke detectors and gas detectors in their homes. Another potential problem for the laryngectomy is driving 
uh, some people may not be able to continue to drive because their neck movements are restricted, which means that they can't actually look adequately over the shoulder when they're driving, and so it becomes dangerous. Laryngectomies that live alone need to be much more aware about their safety, particularly in an emergency and contacting their family and friends. Summoning help can become difficult if their voice is not very good and they do need to find a means of summoning help even when they're in their own home. This can be done by working out codes with their family and relatives, tapping certain things onto the telephone. BT text telephone is another advantage that they may have installed. Alright, I've a, I'm going to call an ambulance. It'll be there shortly, don't worry. In addition to using items such as faxes or texting, you can also use cards. Uh, these are available from the National Association of Laryngectomy Clubs. They're very simple, they're easy to use and readily available. But better than calling for help is staying out of trouble. Anyone who's had a laryngectomy will need to be careful with water. The stoma leads straight to the lungs and water must be kept out. Again, you'll be able to point the way to various shower aids. But surprisingly, swimming remains a possibility, although only in very carefully controlled conditions. A few laryngectomy clubs around the country provide the right environment. Given the right conditions, swimming can be a highly beneficial form of exercise. So, if the local club organises swimming sessions, you may want to suggest they're worth attending. Just contact your local laryngectomy club for advice. Laryngectomy clubs provide a great forum for mutual support. There are about 90 clubs around the UK. If you can encourage anyone you're dealing with to attend, they'll soon feel very welcome and they'll benefit from a wide range of information shared at these clubs. Admission to hospital may bring about many complications for the patient particularly if they're admitted to a ward other than an ENT ward where the nursing staff may be inexperienced in caring for these individuals. In this situation, your knowledge and experience with this patient can be very useful indeed. You can act as liaison with the head and neck unit as well as the patient and their family. I blanked out a year ago and when I was taken to the A&E ward they even gave me a mask to breathe oxygen through the mouth and nose. They wasn't aware there was a special mask to fit over the stoma. And uh, that was quite a frightening experience. It's often when presented in areas that are unfamiliar with their care needs, the ability to use skin transfers, uh, which will identify that the individual has actually undergone a laryngectomy. These can be very useful for individuals undergoing general anaesthetic or requiring further surgery. Most healthcare professionals are well trained in resuscitating uh, people who have a normal larynx. It's therefore very important that all healthcare professionals are aware of the differences presented by the laryngectomy requiring resuscitation. Most importantly, they do not require intubation through the mouth. Intubation should be done through the stoma, the hole in the neck. This is where the tube should be placed. It is perfectly possible to give mouth to stoma ventilation in an absolutely emergency situation. Obviously I don't want to alarm you, but I feel that it's important that you realise that if anything ever happens to either, it would fall on you, Joan, if he ever need resuscitated. You let the medical profession know that he had a laryngectomy because obviously he would need resuscitated through the stoma rather than mouth to mouth. Never assume, as a community nurse, that other professionals are aware of the need to ventilate a laryngectomy via the stoma. The family should be aware that not all healthcare professionals are aware of correct resuscitation procedures for laryngectomy. This is especially true if the patient is not in a head and neck unit. The family then need to be made confident that they can share this information with all healthcare professionals that the patient comes in contact with. And it may be necessary for them to remind 
other hospital staff of the special needs of the laryngectomy. If the patient should need resuscitating, it is important to distinguish whether the patient has a laryngectomy or a tracheostomy. The first aider or paramedic must close off the nose and mouth if in any doubt at all about whether the patient is either a laryngectomy or a tracheostomy patient. It is safer simply to pinch the nose, close the mouth and then apply resuscitation to the stoma. The National Association of Laryngectomy Clubs, NALC, has produced a video and a leaflet that explain all this. While any cancer patient has a tremendous amount of adjusting to face, someone who's had a laryngectomy has the added complications of learning a new method of communication and dealing with their stoma. Helping them to do so can be an enormously rewarding experience. And do remember, there's a lot of help out there. Help that's available to the health professional just as much as the patient. Most of it's free of charge. The main contact details are on the cover of this tape and in the booklet. Laryngectomies can most definitely prove that they are the same person that they were before the operation. It's a case of living with cancer, not dying with it. Go and see some old laryngectomies. They don't know what they're talking about. They'll probably help you more than anybody else because they've been through it and they know all the pitfalls.